So thank you everyone for coming. My name is Maria. This is my uh, first time attending a closure conference. I'm really excited to be here. I'm also really nervous, as you might can tell. Um, so far, I'm having a really good time. I think everyone is really enjoying it. So big shout out to Alex and Lynn and all the people behind the scenes for organizing this awesome conference. I'm originally from beautiful Berlin in Germany, where I studied and I did my undergraduate degree there. And then I think about three years ago, I decided to move to Auckland, New Zealand with my husband to just gain some interna international experience, improve my English. You can probably still hear my German accent. Um, so yeah, but I'm really lucky to live here. This is um, Piha in New Zealand. It's a beautiful place. You should come and visit. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm also from New Zealand, same as Colin. <laughs> but I think Colin, Colin beats me in that regard. I think he has had to uh, travel even further. I think he's from the South Island. <laughs> Sorry? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that would be cool. <laughs> yeah, we have a small terrace and a backyard. Um, so I work in um, Auckland, New Zealand as a closure developer as a, um, at a company called LiveOps. And we do call and contact um, software that is supposed to run in the browser. But I'm also a master's student at Georgia Tech studying towards my online degree or my master's degree. So it's they have this really cool program where you can get a um, master's degree online, so I don't need to go to the US, which is very good if you live in New Zealand. <laughs> um, so being um, a student, I get the chance to participate at this year's Google Summer of Code. Um, I think it was about a year ago or 10 months ago, so not um, too long that I started to learn Clojure and ClojureScript, so I still count myself as a beginner. Um, but yeah, I, uh, I think the first experience I had with ClojureScript was really good. It was um, through Ohm, um, and I worked on a company internal testing framework. And it was just, it was just really amazing how quickly I could move, how easy it was for me to add new functionality to my application. And also the community, community was just really helpful and friendly and welcoming, and I, I just wanted to be part of that great community. Um, so I deci decided to apply for this year's Google Summer of Code, and luckily got accepted um, working on adding JavaScript module support to the compiler and having David Nolan as my mentor, who is an awesome mentor, <laughs> by the way, and you, but you probably know that. Um, so yeah, I spent three months with the compiler and learned a few things about the compiler, and that's what we'll be talking about um, in this talk. So we're having a look at how we get from ClojureScript to JavaScript, so how how does the compiler do it? And, and the intention of the talk is just to show you that I'm not a compiler person, not at all. This is the first compiler that I worked on. Um, and I just want to show you it's not, might not be as scary as it seems. Um, it's just something else that you can learn um, and you can get used to it. So since I learn a lot better with examples, um, I will be using a simple closure script example that will be passing through our different phases of the compiler. And there will be some code, so <laughs> please stick with me. So this is the um, example we're going to be using. It's um, getting the background color property from the body and setting it to a specific CSS color. And I will evaluate this in a second, um, but before I start, does anyone here have a favorite CSS color? Anyone? <laughs> Ah, oh, cool, yeah, I think I heard tomato or something. <laughs> it's actually a um, CSS color, which is surprising. There's also Dodgers blue. <laughs> Funny that they have their own CSS color. So now when we evaluate this, wow, the slides are tomato, <laughs> which is pretty cool. <laughs> oh. mm. <clears throat> So what just happened there is that I'm using um, bootstrap closure script to evaluate the closure script here. So I'm grabbing um, the closure script that is in um, code mirror, that's the editor I'm using here, passing it to the compiler, which gives me JavaScript, and then it's evaluated. And so there's no server involved or anything like this. Everything is just in the browser, which is really cool. And I'll be using this um, throughout my slides. 
Uh, oh, I should probably change it back to white. <laughs> I'm not sure if people want to look at tomato slides. <laughs> cool. So um, let's see, instead of evaluating it, let's see, <clears throat> let's have a look at the JavaScript that comes out of the compiler. So what, that, that's straightforward, right? That's probably what you would have written. It's just a nested property access and then setting it to this specific color. So the compiler can be divided into three main phases, um, reading, analysis, and image. And if you're not familiar with those phases, I wasn't, <laughs> to be honest. Um, and don't worry, I will go th through each of them with our example. And we'll, have, uh, we'll start with reading. So the reader takes uh, ClojureScript as text and outputs just data structures, so cl other Clojure data structures that we're also familiar with and that we also love. Um, and so the thing is that our code is still saved as text files on the disk, right? Um, and we need to have a way to convert it into something that the compiler can deal with, that we can inspect, that we can annotate, those types of things. So that's what the reader does. And the code for the reader that we're using in ClojureScript is actually not located inside the ClojureScript repo itself, but in, instead we're using Clojure.tools.reader, which is a um, contrib project. And the reader has pretty much the same semantics as the reader that you already know from Clojure and is represented by the function read, which takes an input stream. The other cool thing is that over the summer, I think over the summer, um, not too long ago, it was ported from Clojure, so the initial reader is written in Clojure. It was ported from Clojure to Clojure script, which is very useful, or which is required um, for us to have bootstrap Clojure script. So let's look at our example. So here we're using actually the ported reader, which is in Clojure script, and it's represented by the namespace cljs.tools.reader. And we're calling the function instead of read, we're calling a function read string because we don't want to pass an input stream, we want to pass our example as a string. Mm. So when we, uh, when we evaluate this, um, we can see that we get a list stack containing three elements, a symbol, another list, and a string. Um, since you might say, oh, I'm not really sure, you could, uh, might be something else. Let uh, let's actually look at the type. So here we can um, get the type and it's just, it's just an, a list. Um, in this case, it's a closure script list. Um, so this is pretty cool since we now can use the tools that we're already very familiar with, right? We can map over, over it and do lots of things. So for example here, yeah, we can map over the result that the reader returns and get the type of each element in that list. So and then we can see that, yeah, we have a symbol, another list, and just a string. Cool, so coming back to our overview, um, we can change our overview a little bit, and we now know that the reader takes text, um, an input stream, and returns data, stru data structures, and which are passed to the analysis phase. So let's uh, move on to the analysis phase. <coughs> So the analyzer takes the data structures returned by the reader and uh, gives us an AST, also <coughs> called abstract syntax tree. And we'll see in a bit how that looks like. Another cool thing that's happening during the anal anal analysis phase is macro expansion, and we'll also have a look at that one. So you might be thinking, oh, well, hold on, Lisp, that's already a tree, right? You can already see that as a tree. But we actually, we actually need to annotate the tree a little bit. We need more information about our program to be able to emit JavaScript. So the structure will still be the same, kind of. Some things will change, um, but we'll still have, for example, set bang as a root node, but instead um, have a map as a, as a node there with more information. So here's an example um, node in the AST for true. Um, which is very simple. And you can see that a node is a map which contains at least three keys, um, up, form, and env. Up just specifies which um, type the node has. In this case, it's a constant. Form holds the initial form that was passed to the analysis phase. 
and env is short for environment and holds a map which is, just has more information about the environment um, such as the namespace or lines or columns and those kinds of things. So let's look at the, let's go back to our example and look at the um, AST for our example. So here I'm creating a simple user environment and setting it um, the namespace to the default namespace cljs.user. I'm passing the example as a string to the reader, as we've seen before. The reader returns the data structures, and then I'm passing the um, data structure to the analyzer, which is um, represented in the namespace CLJS.analyzer, and takes um, an environment and our, our form. Right, so when I evaluate this, <laughs> it's quite a lot. <laughs> Um, and we'll see in a bit why that's the case, and I'll show you a better overview so it's because it's a bit difficult to um, tell what's going on here. Mm. But then, since this is just a data structure, it's just a map, we can, to get an overview, we can, for example, look at the keys to see what our root node has, um, what uh, kind of keys our root node has. So we can see, okay, it has env op form. We already know, know those ones. Those are old news. Um, and then we have target well and children. So children is um, a key value pair that every node has who has child elements and is a vector that includes those child elements as nodes. And this is, can be really useful if you want to traverse the AST without actually knowing more information about the node. And then we have target and val which are node-specific keys. So for example, an if node would have the specific keys test, then, and else. In our case here, we have target and val. And target and val will just be other AST nodes. Um, um, and target is the target, which will be the background color property, and val is our um, string CSS color constant. Cool, so um, this is the root node. It's a map and has, um, is a of type set bang, and this tells us already quite a lot. This tells us, us that it's not, set bang is actually not a function, otherwise the node type would be invoke. And then if we look at the form, we can see the form is still the same form that we passed in. So this tells us that set bang is also not a macro, otherwise the form would have changed. So then we have env, and um, the children key containing those child nodes that um, target and val that we've seen before. So if we look at the target key node, um, we can see the target is of type dot, which tells us it's a JavaScript interop. So you have dot, for example, if you um, access a property or if you invoke a function. In our case, we're accessing a property, and we can see that because we have an extra key called field, um, which points to the field that we're accessing. And then this node also has another um, target because we can see if we, look at the, if we look at the form, it has been expanded. Um, so this tells us that dot dot is actually macro. So this one, this dot node will have another target, which will have another target, not heard of it, um, until we finally arrive at the end, which is just our final target is just a document. On the other hand side, um, or on the other side, the um, val key just holds a simple constant node <laughs> um, for our color. Cool, so how, how, does, how does it work in the code? How is this AST constructed? Um, so this is just a simple <laughs> overview, um, and we start at the very top, there's this analyze function, and this one basically just checks um, which type our form has. So here's the code for that one. That's actually, um, that one's actually included in the ClojureScript repo um, in the file analyzer.cljc. <laughs> A funny note on the side, when I started to look at those files, I think in May, April or May, um, it still had CLJ ending, <laughs> and then eventually it changed to CLJC because um, David started to work on the bootstrap compiler, and started to work on the bootstrap compiler, 
Um, so he changed quite a lot of things. Um, so this one needed to have CLJC because we now have ClojureScript specific stuff in there so that the same file actually, um, the same code can be used for the bootstrap um, compiler. So it's just a way to see or just from, yeah, things are moving really quickly. <laughs> So here, analyze form takes a form, and um, um, as I said before, checks the type. So if we have a symbol, or if we have a sequence, a map, a vector, a set, a keyword, an instance, or an empty list, and then it does specific things. Or if none of these is true, we'll have a constant, which will be the case for our value, right? Because what white was just a string. And then we can emit um, the AST for that constant right away. And you can also see that um, here, we do some type inference where we check, ah, oh, is this a string? And then we can um, give this AST node a tag. But for our root node, um, the second condition will be true since we're having a list. So, okay, we don't have a map, we don't have a vector, we have a list. So we can move on to analyze sequence. And analyze sequence, analyze sequence actually does um, the macro expansion. So we get a form and then we expand one level and then we check is the expanded form still the same one as the initial form? If yes, we can move on because we know we don't have a, we don't have a macro. If, if not, we have to start all over again <laughs> with the expanded form. So we just start from the stop and call and analyze recursively. So then we move on to analyze sequence which checks if our first element, which in our case will be set bang, is a special form or not. Um, here you can see, um, here are the special forms um, in a set and you can see that set bang is part of that set. Um, and if it's not a special form, it will be a function and we'll move on to a parse invoke, but in our case, um, set bang is a special form. Yeah, so that's the path we're taking. Set bang is not a macro, so we can move on to special uh, to the special, special form and then move on to parse. And parse is just a multi-method which um, dispatches on the type of the node. So in our case, set bang. And here you can see at the very end, we're finally emitting the AST for set bang, um, but we also need to evaluate or get the ASTs for the target and the value. And that's also done recursively. So we're calling analyze again for the target and the value. Um, Sorry, drop this one. Right, so coming back to our overview, we've now seen the analyzer takes a data structure, it does macro ex expansion, and then returns an abstract syntax tree, which is also just a simple data structure that we can um, traverse and have a look at and change things, so it's, which is really cool. So now let's move on to our final phase emission. So the emission phase takes the AST generated by the analyzer and finally returns the JavaScript. And the way it returns the JavaScript is by basically just printing whatever out is bound to. So out, for example, could be bound to a file, which is cool, but it could also be bound to a string. So straight back into the code again, we see that um, similar to the analyzer, we have a, a function where all the action basically happens or where we're, which is our entry point where we always go back to when we want to emit um, the next node. So emit takes our AST that we um, got from the analyzer and then also checks the type again if we have a map, which we'll have initially. Um, but we could have other things. And if none of those things is true, we'll go to the very um, to the default case, which will basically just, as you can see, print whatever we have. Um, so for our constant node, it would print white. So we move on since we still have the map. Um, the second condition will be true, so we will call emit. And emit is just a wraparound emit star, which is just is another um, multi-method which dispatches on the node type. In our case, again, set bang. And here you can see that we're already getting a hint of the final JavaScript. We already have the target on the left, then the equal string, 
and then the value on the right, which is pretty cool. Um, and it's calling emits, the function that we've seen before, recursively again, because we need to figure out what kind of um, strings we want to generate for the target and the value. So the target, as we've seen before, is a dot node. And here, for our dot node, we said, OK, it's a property access, not a function invocation. So the f we'll, we will have a field value. Um, so it will go into the then instead of the else branch. And we can see that we're emitting the properties from right to left. So we start at the most nested one, um, at the, which will be the background color, and then work our, our way um, up or down, depending on how you want to see it, to the final target, which will be the JavaScript document. So for our um, um, CSS color, we said we have a constant node. Um, and this basically just calls another function, which is a multi-method multi again, and um, checks what kind of um, constant we have. And here we're, getting, here we're getting the initial form of that constant, which, if you remember, was just a string, and then emitting it, which will um, go into the default switch case and just print that string. Cool. So let's put it all together. Um, here, again, we have our example as a string. Um, we then pass it to the reader that we've seen before, pass the data structure to the analyzer. Analyzer gives us the AST. And then we call um, into the emission phase. The emission phase is represented um, by the namespace cljs.compiler. Um, and we will call emit string, which will bind out to a string. Oh, and if we evaluate that, we get our final JavaScript that we've seen before initially, which is pretty cool. Um, right, so now that you've, um, <laughs> of course I have to have a cat picture in there. <laughs> um, so now that we've um, seen how the compiler works, I'm pretty sure you want to contribute to it, right? <laughs> um, Luckily, um, Clojure and ClojureScript and the other contra projects use um, Jira or Jira or Jira um, to, to manage tasks and for bug reports and those kind of things. And it's public. So you can just go have a look at the task and see what people are working on. Get a f can, you can get a feeling of the process, of um, how people interact with, with, with each other, which is pretty cool. But also, um, and which helped me initially quite a lot, um, was that their both Clojure and ClojureScript and probably other contra projects have um, a label called whoo, a newbie label. And you can actually just go uh, to Jira, search for your project, um, select just tasks that are open, and just search for the newbie label, and that will give you all the tasks that have this label. And I think currently in ClojureScript, it's about six tasks. So this was really helpful for me, um, because that's how I found my first task um, to contribute to ClojureScript. So how does, the, how does the contribution process work? So you need to sign the CA first. Um, it should probably take about five or 10 minutes. Um, then create a Jira account but also ask on the mailing list for permissions, um, because if you want to um, edit your task and things like that, you need to have um, the proper permissions. And um, just ask on the mailing list or in Slack. Um, people are very happy to give you those permissions. Um, then you can look at the task. Um, either you have something that you want to work on yourself, or you pick one of the newbie tasks, and just ask around if someone else is already working on that or not. Or, and just communicate and tell people that you would like to work on this task now that, so that they know. Then you go, you clone the ClojureScript project, um, make some changes, and then once you're happy with them, you squash all of your commits into a single patch and attach that one to your Jira task. And then you could, for example, ask people to try out your patch depending on if it's a bigger one or not. Um, and then if everything Looks good, it will be merged, and you'll be happy. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, and one thing to keep in mind is that um, 
Um, you don't necessarily need to write code to contribute. This was um, true for me in the first case. So my first, I already mentioned my first task was a newbie task. And um, what I did was um, I added a bunch of doc strings to all the closure script core protocols, which were quite a lot. <laughs> um, but it was, a good, it was a good starting point for me. I could go through the code, um, get a feeling for the process, and it, was, it just felt really good to just give back and, um, and contribute and yeah, learn about the process, basically. There are lots of other things, other ways you can contribute. Um, for example, you can write about things that you're trying out, um, blog about it. There are never enough resources or information um, online. Um, I think Mike Fikes, he also has a YouTube channel um, where he um, um, creates little screencasts or videos about the things that he's trying out with ClojureScript and React Native. So you, for example, could do that. If you build a cool application with ClojureScript, make that one public and tell people about it so that people can look at your code. And this also helped me initially quite a lot to look at other people's code to figure out how they're using ClojureScript. Test other people's patches. There's a um, CLJS-dev channel on Slack where people ask um, if you want to test their patches and those types of things. Or you can test a pre-release, which is also really appreciated. Uh, you can report bugs. And if you do that, Probably it's important to keep in mind what um, Stuart Holloway said yesterday. Try to provide a minimal repository and make sure the errors are not in your tooling. That will just save your um, maintainers a lot of time if you provide something that people can take and reproduce your problem with. Um, and then, of course, go out into the world, answer questions. Um, there are lots of channels. We have the mailing list, we have the IRC channel, and we have the Slack channel where always people around ask questions. And it's really appreciated if you answer those questions. So references that helped me quite a lot were, of course, the ClojureScript code base. Um, it's very readable. Um, you can go have a look at that one. Then there's a cool talk um, from um, Michael Fogus from Closure West 2012, where he talks about the Closure Script anatomy and he gives more motivation for Closure Script, but also goes through the compilation pipeline, similar as um, what we did today. Um, there's another cool talk from Timothy Baldridge from Closure West um, last year, and he talks about data, all the ASTs. And um, what he talks about is that there's another Contra project called. Um, Closure Tools Analyzer um, that actually does the things or similar things that the analyzer does in, in, in Closure Script. And he, he talks about that, and it's just a good way to know or learn more about the AST. And then there's um, this cool project created by David um, called Hello Dash CLJSC, C for the compiler, um, um, which is just a collection of um, code and walking you through all the all the steps, and you can actually go in, try it out, um, have a look at the AST, manipulate it, and it's just really, really a cool project to get your um, hands dirty. Cool. Um, I think, yeah, that's it. I, I probably rushed through it quite a lot, so we have time for um, questions. <laughs>